Today on Across the Fence, we're checking in on this year's apple crop with a visit to the UVM Horticulture Research and Education Center. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for choosing Across the Fence. I'm Will Michael. It's said that apples and autumn in Vermont all go together, and there's nothing tastier and fresher than picking an apple grown right here in the Green Mountain State. So to learn more about the apples we grow and about this growing season, we've come to the UVM Center in South Burlington, also known as the Hort Farm. And Terry Bradshaw is the center director, one of the state's foremost apple experts. Great to see you again. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Will. So the 21 apple crop, both in terms of uh, the quantity and the quality of the fruit. Yeah, we've had this thing in, in Vermont for about the last 10 or 12 years where odd numbered years tend to be our heavier crop year just because of kind of a fluke of what happened with some frost back in 2010, 2012 and how apples tend to have this sort of biennial production. Um, so this what you would think would be the heavy crop year. That's what you're setting us up for. Absolutely. Well, growers do all they can to try to keep things at an even keel. They thin the fruit a little heavier, kind of like folks who grow carrots will, will take out the extra carrot so you okay. get a bigger carrot. Um, so growers, you know, did more thinning. That weather was really erratic, which actually helped increase the thinning back in June. It was kind of hot during that period. More apples fell off, but we had a heavier crop to, to start with. Um, so overall, I hope this is actually going to slow down that, that kind of uh, uh, oscillating of the years. But we've got, I would say, a, a normal kind of high to normal uh, crop load this year, which is good. Terry, what about overall? Um, I, I believe you've told me apples are the number two crop in Vermont? Number two specialty crop after okay. maple in terms of total value uh, produced. Um, sometimes mixed vegetables sort of might, might raise up to number two depending on the year, but there's no one vegetable that, that kind of pushes apples But the out. point is this is an, an important economic part of, of the state of Vermont. Yeah, it, it's, it lends itself to diversified farms. We're seeing more and more agritourism around, uh, for, you know, apples and apple production. Um, so it's a really important uh, economic driver of, you know, the ag sector in Vermont. And another thing I've learned from you over the years is that apples are grown commercially, I think, in 13 of our 14 counties. Yep. We know that weather is always a factor when you're involved in agriculture. So what impact is climate change having or is expected to have on Vermont's apple crop? Yeah, I, you know, I think the, the biggest impact that we're seeing, or I'd say the biggest effect that we're seeing, is comes from just the erratic nature of uh, wet, dry, wet, dry. We just saw that in one year, where last year it was dry for essentially most of the state was in arguably a drought, um, in some places a true drought. Um, this year it was looking like that going into May, June, and then we had some extremely wet uh, conditions in the southern part of Vermont. Especially if you live in Bennington, Rutland counties, yeah, you've, Wyndham, yeah, Windsor, you've Windsham. seen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I know of an orchard. I have a weather station in an orchard down near Putney, uh, 14 inches of rain in, in five weeks. So, you know, these extremes are, are tricky. Um, these are trees. They have deep roots. They have their, their woody perennial structures. They've been around. They can, they're resilient plants. I'd say it makes it more difficult to just manage the site. You know, wet spots where you're driving through mud, dry where, you know, you, you've got to water the trees. So, the, you know, the reliability that we had for, I'd say, the 40 or so years that I'm most familiar with, uh, you know, the 10 years that predate, you know, me being in this business, but, you know, seeing where it came from um, to now, it's just become more variable. The other big change, I would say the two changes are on the shoulder seasons. So uh, we see apples that bloom a little bit earlier, five to maybe seven days earlier, but the frosts don't come that much earlier. So we're at a greater frost risk. We haven't seen huge ones back in 2012 was the last time it was a, a, a big issue. On the other side in the fall, we're seeing extended long warm falls, which is great, right? Uh, September is, is the new August, I guess. Uh, but it changes the ripening. So uh, this year is a little bit different. We've actually had some cool nights, but when we have those long, warm uh, nights in late in the fall, varieties like Macintosh that are that, that evolved, if you will, for our market, um, really sweeten up with cool nights. And so people are planting different varieties. Um, people are planting different kinds of trees and managing them different. It's just 
you're always thinking. There's just a lot more to think about. And one of the things I'm picking up on, if I'm not mistaken, that you're talking about there at the end is that uh, maybe traditional cultivars or varieties, climate will change what you might be able to grow. And another cultivar might be more successful down the road. Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, I think Macintosh is always going to be a predominant, so it's still 45%, 40, 45% of the crop. It used to be 85%. Um, our population has a certain taste for Macintosh. Uh, that said, uh, that flavor is is kind of aging out as new varieties come around. You know, the Honeycrisp revolution was truly a revolution and changed how people relate to apples. Um, and Terry, I learned from one of your mentors who used to be at the university, Elena Garcia, yeah. that uh, culture and heritage, where we come from, affects the taste and how we uh, 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 she told me this as someone of Hispanic descent, which I found fascinating. Yeah, I often ask people what their favorite apple is, and within a certain range, I can often tell what region of the country they're from. Uh, if, if they say Macintosh, it's probably New England, northern New England. Uh, if they say wine sap, you know, it's going to be from the mid-Atlantic. Um, but the, the, the wild card is uh, when people pull out these apples that really either aren't grown in certain Rio, uh, Granny Smith, I, I can't tell you where you're from. Um, that's, that's one that's not grown in the Northeast. It's an international apple and we're seeing more and more international apples. Uh, so yeah, it's a funny one. Well, let me segue if I can to apple picking. Yep. In a time of year of pandemic, uh, people on their devices, it can be tough to get outside. That's changed. Apple picking changes all of that. People love to get out. Absolutely. It transcends uh, generations. Uh, it's, it's interesting. Last year, uh, growers were overwhelmingly responding to uh, the demand coming from customers to the point where usually second week of October, you, you, that's kind of your, your big push, you know, uh, just, just before the frosts come, we were having orchards that were selling out the third week of September. No apples left. Uh, and that was a good problem to have. Uh, I don't know if it's quite that level uh, this year, but I am hearing from growers that they're getting very, very strong responses. That, that push to get back out in the orchard did not subside. Great for the economy and great for physical activity and our taste buds. Absolutely. It's a, awesome. Uh, like milking a cow, there's a, there's a technique to picking an apple and it helps uh, the sustainability of the orchard. So could you touch quickly and we'll put some pictures in of how do you properly pick an apple? The thing about an apple is next year's apple is already on the tree. So the bud that will form next year's apple is there. And if you pick it wrong and you tear that bud off, you will compromise the cropping for the following year. So it's really important to hold the apple gently so you're not bruising it, but, but fairly firmly so that you can twist it. And you don't have to twist it like you're, like you're turning a, a screw, but a gentle roll and rolling it off of that bud, which is often right next to the stem, is an important thing to do. So not as important how we pick it, not just for the fruit we're getting now, but it impacts what happens in ensuing years. Absolutely, absolutely. I have asked you this before, everybody wants their apples to be red. Uh, sometimes it's red on one side, green on the other, a little bit of green. Uh, just explain to us what's happening there. Sure, there's, there's three ways that an apple turns red. One, some are just red from the beginning. So there are certain varieties that just, that's their genes and they're like a red delicious and the new strains, they're red when they're the size of a dime. Um, more of the apples that we're used to, the Macintosh type, um, that have a stripy or a gold or a, a yellow and uh, uh, red sides, they either need to be exposed to the sun, so the sunny cheek is the one that turns red, or they need those cold nights, and those cold nights will actually trigger a, a process in the apple that will, will redden up the fruit. Terry, what kind of apples do you grow here at the Hort Farm, and, and is everything here a research project? We grow about 50 some varieties now. Some are remnants from an old variety trial that had 22, 23 varieties and probably six that were any good. And that's why you do trials, you weed out the ones that aren't any good. So we, we have some remnants of that. Um, we grow a lot of your commonly grown apples, Macintosh, Empire, Honeycrisp. Um, we also grow cider fruit as part of my research program. Um, and then some remnants from prior research programs. So this tree I'm in front of is a New York 75414, excellent apple, uh, bred from the Cornell breeding program. Uh, will probably never get commercially released because it just didn't rise above the standards of some of the others that have come out since then. So it's kind of a relic. 
increasingly we're growing more for education, I would say, than for research. I mean, I have research nested throughout the orchard in different, different spots. Uh, but I teach an orchard production class. We teach a season-long farmer training program where those students interact with the orchard and learn a bit about orchard management. So it's as much a teaching space as it is a research space. So teaching, research, uh, is there other work that's done here? You have CSA sales, uh, other things? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the produce grown at the farm is sold to the UVM community, and that's a broad community. Um, so we have three main outlets. We have uh, a CSA, a community supported agriculture where people pre-purchase both apples and vegetables. We also have about four, four or so acres of vegetables. Um, we sell to UVM food service. So students are actually eating our fruit in the dining halls. And then we have a retail stand here on the farm that, that's been going on for over 50 years. Uh, very dedicated clientele because people love to get a New York 75414 that they can't get anywhere else. I want to get to one other thing. We've got about a minute left. What about the opportunities for students? A good example. Right now I have uh, about 10 interns, student interns, that are doing various aspects of, uh, of, of work on the farm. Right now, of course, it's mostly apple picking because that's the, the big thing that needs to be done. Um, but those students will do everything from prune the trees, uh, manage weeds, work in the vegetable fields. And so that's, that's the internship program. Um, I have a number of students who work in my research program, collecting data and helping process data over the winter. And then we have multiple classes where students actually take a credit bearing class. And for UVM uh, alum, I just want to point out that's through the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences Absolutely. and the Plant and Soil Science Department, that's which right. you're a part of. Yep. Well, for more information about the farm, including the farmstead uh, sales that Terry mentioned, you can check the website on your screen. It is uvm.edu slash cals slash H-R-E-C. Terry, thank you so much for having us here this afternoon. I always learn something when I visit with you. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Thanks. That is our program for today. We know you have choices, so thanks for choosing us. I'm Will Michael, inviting you to join us back here each weekday afternoon for another visit across the fence.